Is Jim going to come give my introduction? Oh, no, you. Okay, I'm cool with that. All right, how's that? Good morning, and uh, welcome to day two of Nauticon 6. It's my pleasure to introduce Adrian Crenshaw. And uh, his bio is he's a uh, Polish hammer thrower and an Olympic gold medal winner from the 2000 Summer Games in Sydney. He also won the gold medal at the World Championship in Edmonton 2001 with a career best throw of 83.38 meters. And for his sports achievements, he received the Knight's Cross of the Order of Polonia Restituta, fifth class. So I give you Adrian Huntroff. Thank you. So I actually did send in bio information when I uh, submitted my talk. But anyway, my presentation is going to be on making hacking video tutorials. Everybody's uh, seen these video tutorials. I have a ton of them on my site. One of the ones you see a lot of people make is, how do I crack web? That seems to be the most popular subject matter. But I got a ton of these on my website. Uh, a little bit about me, I run irongeek.com, specialized mostly in uh, uh, computer security videos, uh, pen testing videos and so forth, some text articles, a few software tools. Uh, I have an interest in InfoSec education. I'm not so much big into the idea of pursuing a career where I'm doing stuff as much as I am teaching stuff, if that makes any sense. I like the lab environment where you can figure out new things, not are constantly doing the same thing over and over again. And uh, I don't know everything. This is why I brought, borrow a little uh, bit from uh, Bruce Potter. I don't know everything. Question what I say. Yeah, the things I'll screw up. And if I screw up, let me know, and I'll try to correct things. And my presentations vary. Sometimes I'm going off and giving a very, pre uh, very good uh, professional presentation. So sometimes they're like this, and sometimes they're a little bit more like that. Being that this is not a con, I'm thinking the second picture is going to apply a little bit more than the first. All right. Now, my qualifications for giving this particular presentation are eh, somewhat questionable, I suppose. But I've been doing this for a while. Uh, the videos on my site are fairly popular, as far as I can tell. People seem to like them. Uh, I have a lot of more time on my hands than the average computer geek. So I have the time to actually sit down, play with the tools, figure out how they work, and regurgitate it in a form that I can teach other people. I have this pet theory that the best person to teach someone else something is someone who's just learned it themselves. For instance, if you have a C++ guru who's been doing it for 20 years, teaching a complete newbie, he's going to have a bit of a problem because he's going to take things for granted and think the person's going to know things that they don't. Uh, however, someone who's just learned C++ themselves knows the common pitfalls that a newbie has and can show them how to get around them. So that's my pet theory on education. It's best to teach someone that's just below your own level because you realize all the pitfalls that a, a newbie to a subject is going to have. And my other qualification, do a Google search for hacking videos sometime. All right. How I got started making hacking videos. Um, I found this tool called Cam Studio, which allows you to take your Windows desktop and everything that was on it and make a video of it. It would output the both uh, SWF, your Shockwave Flash files, and uh, also uh, AVIs. And I thought this was kind of neat. I found all sorts of tools like Kane that had really complicated GUIs. How many people out there have ever used Kane? Kane's an awesome, great security tool, but he's uh, mouse packed so much stuff into that one tool, the GUI is impossible to navigate for a complete newbie. You have to show, well, you got to go here, here, and here. And it's not something you can describe in a text file, saying, click on this tab, go to this sub menu, go find this checkbox. Really hard to, comp to explain in text, but fairly easy to do in a video. I slacked off for quite a while. I started actually doing some of my earlier hacking videos back in uh, 2002. Then I kind of lost interest for a while. Then I saw, and you can jeer or not jeer, depending on your opinion on Kevin Rose. <laughs> I saw an episode of The Broke, and I was like, OK, he's getting back into doing these computer security videos, these hacking videos. I think I should get back into it, too. And I got a Sharp Zorus and started publishing notes on how to get various hacking tools to run on the Sharp Zorus, bought my own domain name, and just started it started, uh, snowballing from there. OK, why videos? Why do videos to teach various uh, computer security tools and hacking tools and not just write up large text files on how to use them? 
Well, there's a lot of fucking GUIs out there that are really complex and hard to understand. And it's hard to say, click here, go here, go there, choose this submenu in text, where you can just go click, 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 and show them in a video. Uh, that goes back in the whole showing things visually is sometimes easier than writing about it. If I was just going to show stuff at a Unix command prompt, writing about it's perfectly fine. And actually, in many ways, I have this uh, pet theory that command line interfaces are actually easier to teach people on because you, you say type in this as opposed to click this, click that, click this. A uh, little bit of a Vista rant. Now, again, I saw these videos way before Vista came out, but it seems like a lot of tools are going further and further away from the, uh, the, the paradigm of using text to describe things you click on. The, it used to be I could, if someone calls me up and they had a problem on the Windows box, I'd say click the start bar. But if they had the default Vista interface, there isn't really a start bar. I have to say, click on that little Windows-like icon that's kind of not really a window, but it looks kind of like a window and it's got this little wavy thing to it. Or let's say, um, I used to be able to say in a Microsoft Office, click File Save. Now they have the little ribbons and the round button and it's just needlessly a pain in the ass to explain over the phone. But in a video, no particular problem. And uh, some hackers' manager types are too lazy to actually read. If you have something you want to explain to your boss why this particular exploit or vulnerability is so bad, they're not going to necessarily be able to sit there and read a text file and go, oh, OK, this is why it's bad. But if you show them a video, yes, here's Metasploit, and in 10 seconds, they've pwned the website. That's something they might pay a little bit more attention to. And some concepts, once again, are just easy to understand if you illustrate them visually than just reading about them. For instance, I have a video on the basics of using Nmap, and I sit there and I do an animation of uh, doing a sin scan where you sin the, see the sin, sin act, act packets going back and forth, and it gives you a more visual cue into how it works. All right, here are the tools I use whenever I make my videos. And I'm also going to add a few alternatives for people who aren't using the exact same platform I am. The first main tool I use is uh, one called Cam Studio. Now, it had been out for quite a while. Unfortunately, it, it was originally open source, but then it went closed source, and I think, uh, oh, some other tool now implements the code that was originally in Cam Studio. Camtasia. Camtasia, thanks. But Cam Studio did everything I really needed, and someone else, the person at camstudio.org, has taken the project back up and is trying to restart it, though I'm not sure how much success he's had with that. But both of those links at the top you can use to uh, get a copy of Cam Studio. It captures videos of the Windows desktop, everything you see, or you can just choose a particular sub area to record. And I plan on doing some showing of that live here in a bit. Uh, you can record out the Shockwave Flash files or AVI files. I personally, even though my end product is going to be a Shockwave Flash, I usually record to an AVI and re-import later for reasons I'll talk about. Uh, a few, oh, you can also do a webcam picture in the picture. So if you really want to have the live part of, your, of you saying stuff, you could put that in a corner and have all the rest of the video around it so people can see you talking as they see what's on your screen, which is pretty neat. I don't regularly use that feature. A few tips on using Cam Studio if you decide to. Set it to about uh, five frames per second. If we're talking about capturing your, the video from your desktop. Really, those changes aren't that frequent. Now, if you have like real motion video going on in the background, maybe you should turn that up. But for just average uh, things where you're clicking around the GUI interface, five frames a second seems to be just fine. And Cam Studio has this lossless codec that's really good for um, screen captures because now, granted, some of the modern operating systems put all these glitz on the screen that has like a um, a progressive shading and crap that makes it hard to compress. But if you manage the way your desktop looks properly, if you have large sections of the same color, that compresses down super small. And this lossless compression algorithm, you don't lose anything. You don't get the little jaggies like when you use JPEG compression. And, but you still get very small file sizes, something you can work with. So I highly recommend using the Cam Studio lossless codec when capturing your video. Now, for a few alternatives for people who don't want to use this, there's Wink, and I'm not sure how many platforms Wink supports. I'm pretty sure it does support Windows. I think it may support Linux as well. 
And uh, I was talking to John Strand of Paul.com, and he was telling me uh, this is what he uses, I show, I show you. He uses that on OS 10 for his captures. So that's a few alternatives if you're on a different platform than me. Another tool I use is Audacity. Now, Cam Studio, you can record the audio live, but I've sat there and started recording and then screwed up what I wanted to say and uh, had to go on back and redo it. And that's hard to do in a video, but it's easy to do in an audio file. Audacity makes it really dirt simple to go in, take out your, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is what I meant to do. Those little pauses like that, Audacity makes that really easy to remove. And it also has this really cool noise removal feature. So if you have crappy sound hardware, you can somewhat compensate by using its noise removal feature, which I plan on showing you in a bit, to make everything sound a little bit better. Uh, real quick tip on that. What I do usually is I export to a raw WAV file before I import into a, before I import into a Flash. That way I get the best sound quality. You don't really want to export to MP3, then have it get MP3 compressed again. Every time you do a lossy compression, you lose some sound quality. And modern hard drives are so big, it's, uh, <coughs> the size of the WAV files isn't too much of a problem. All right, a few other tools I use. Let's see, VNC is one. Now I use VNC, people ask me, well all right, this is a, a Windows tool you're using for doing your screen captures. So how are you capturing your Linux box or how are you capturing your uh, N810? Well the way I do that is with VNC. I ex essentially export the display using VNC to my Windows box, then I use Cam Studio on my Windows box to actually capture the video. So if you've seen a presentation where I talk about using the uh, Nokia N810, which is the little internet tablet. Let me see, I whip one out. The way I would uh, put that online is just to put VNC server on this, connect to it from my Windows box, and capture the video that way. Um, it's really good for that. And a few other alternatives. I've done a f one video on uh, some Windows mobile tool called uh, Wi-Fi Faux Fum for doing war driving. For that, I use a tool called My Mobler which essentially acts somewhat like VNC for the locally connected phone or uh, PDA and export the display that way. And I've also used RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, on a Windows box to go to another box of mine, export the display, and capture it on the machine I'm on. Nice advantage of doing that is I get rid of the little Cam Studio logo that you might see on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen when you do the capture. Another tool I use regularly more and more so is VMware. The nice thing about VMware is I can run a different operating system in a sub-window and do all my capturing still using my Windows tools, but um, so I have my convenience of Windows, but I have my other sub-operating system there that I'm ready to capture everything from. And so most of my backtrack uh, demos I've done using uh, VMware. Now a few other nice things about uh, VMware I recommend going with VMware Player most of the time. It seems to run a little bit faster, and if you really want to edit your own VMs, which you pretty much have to do, there's a freeware tool called uh, VMX Builder that essentially allows you to create your own VMs. VMware Player just lets you play others, and they expect you to buy a, oh, what is it, the full VMware Studio to be able to actually make them, or VMware Server. You don't really need that. You just need VMware Player, and then VMware VMX Builder will let you build your own VMs. Uh, a few tips. If you hunt around some, um, let's say I want to do a video on using various Wi-Fi tools and backtrack. You can get USB Wi-Fi devices, depending on what they are, to work inside a backtrack inside of a VM. You're not going to be able to get your PCMCIA cards. You're not going to be able to get your PCI cards to work. However, if you want to show off Wi-Fi stuff, you can get it to work if it's USB and it has the right chipset. I had an old Prism 2 uh, USB Wi-Fi device, never could get it to work in VMware with backtrack running or any uh, OS besides uh, Windows XP as the guest OS. Does anybody know the difference between host OS and guest OS? The host OS is basically your main OS you're running on the box, the guest OS is the one you're running inside the VM. Uh, however, if I, I've then found RA Link is a company that makes uh, chipsets for Wi-Fi devices, this stuff seems to work really well inside of VMware. 
and I'm currently, I don't mean the exact chipset, but if you find something from RA Link, I found something on Deal Extreme that was like 23 bucks for an 802.11 in card, and if a little tweaking or backtrack, you can get it to work. And I plan on doing some more videos on uh, using various wireless tools and backtrack using that particular adapter. Now there's a lot of alternatives out there to VMware. A lot of people seem to like VirtualBox. I hear good things about it. I personally haven't played with it much. And there's a whole lot of others. If you're on a Mac, there's a VMware Fusion and there's Parallels. But I haven't played with them myself. I just started using VMware Player and it's so far worked for me pretty well. Another tool I use is VirtualDub. VirtualDub is used for doing all sorts of uh, filtering. It's basically a linear video editor as opposed to a nonlinear video editor where you can move this AVI here, move it here, move it there, jump around. This is more like you can tack these AVIs together if they're the right format. You can apply various filters to them, like put a little logo in the bottom right hand corner. Or the main thing I use Virtual Dub for is adding, removing one or two frames at a time and resizing. The reason I do the, um, mo the frame management like that is uh, sometimes I'll do a video recording first to show everything, because it's hard to sometimes sit there and record the video and say everything you want to do and not flub it and not stutter it and get it out right. Sometimes it's easier just to record the video. But then you have a problem of having enough time in the video to say everything you want and to do all the explanation you want in time with the video. So what I'll do is I'll use virtual dub, go in, copy a few frames, and I'm doing like five frames a second, so I copy five frames, so if I need a 10 extra seconds to say something, I can just copy those five frames, paste them 10 times, and now I have the time to make an audio file of everything I need in it. And what I'll do is I'll sit there with virtual dub up and also Audacity up at the same time, see what point I am at virtual dub, and if I need more time to say something in Audacity, I'll just add a few more frames and do it. The other main thing I do with uh, Virtual Dub besides just those little frame edits to get more time or less time to make the audio and video sync up right is uh, resize. Now you can't, probably can't, I'm breaking my own rules here, you probably can't read that. My, for my playing with it, if you want to do resizing of uh, a video, use a uh, Bicubic or a uh, Lincozo 3, I think that's how you might pronounce that particular algorithm. Those give very good results. A lot of uh, tools out there that do video resizes, they do something called nearest neighbor, and when you do a resize down to a smaller size, you get this little blocky effect, and it looks like hell. A lot of times when I do my video capture, I do video capture in 800 by 600, then for file size reasons, I shrink it down to 640 by 480, and I have found that if you use Bicubic or Lincozo, it's still very, very readable after you do the resize. So that's the reason I use those. And uh, I also sometimes use a tool called AVI Demux. For instance, if someone sends me a MOV file to put in, the problem with uh, Virtual Dub is it's pretty much only for AVIs. The nice thing about AVI Demux is it's another, right, Virtual Dub and AVI Demux are both open source tools. Uh, the great thing about AVI Demux is it's multi platform and it supports pretty much any video format you can think. You want to convert from MOV to uh, FLV, you can do it. AVI to MOV, no problem. Any which way you want to go, you have all sorts of controls for manipulating the audio. And if you just want to take this video format and throw it into a different video format, I haven't really found anything better than AVI Demux for doing that kind of thing. If uh, virtual dub buffs on the output you're trying to throw into it, or the input you're trying to throw into it, give a, a AVI Demux a, a try. It works pretty well for most of the media formats I've tried. Now, the only tool I use that's not freeware is I use Flash MX 2004. Now, there's much newer versions. The reason is I have a license to this, and actually I have a license to a newer version as well, but the newer version I was having some problems importing my video, so I'm still using the old version of Flash, but it works for me. Now, the reason I use Flash for my final video as opposed to putting out just a big old AVI is most people have a Flash um, plug-in in their web browser nowadays. I mean, very few people don't. I occasionally get people who complain to me and say, why are you making this Flash? I can't play it on my BSD system running on an ARM processor. Screw you. Get a different system for looking at it. I have people contact me occasionally and say, can you make your videos work on my BlackBerry Storm? OK, you realize you're like a 1% niche at best. <laughs> but do you really want to look at my videos on your Storm? 
Is it really that worthwhile to you yeah. when you could just go to a PC and look at them? Yeah. <laughs> but nice thing with Flash is, does, even though it's proprietary in its way, it's um, very commonly found. So it's good that way. And also, I noticed when I put stuff out in the past, people would rip it off and just take it and put it on their own website. So at least now when they do that, since it's a Flash file, there's tons of links in it that f point back to my own site. And another nice thing about doing my uh, tutorials in Flash is if I want to give links to the tools or more information, I can just embed the link. And instead of the person having to type it in, they can just click on the link. And instantly, they're off to the uh, other tutorial or a link to the tool that I'm mentioning in the tutorial. Also, it's really good for doing animations. For instance, my InMap uh, tutorial where I do the uh, send packets going back and forth. All right, a little more information. I've also come up with a rig for doing live video captures. Now, Ted's rig is a lot better than mine. I'd go talk to Ted about these kind of things, because he, his, his way of doing things is going to be a lot better. And I haven't totally tested out my rig. I've, I came up with the idea for it. Then I saw how um, Skydog and crew down out of zone and Freaknik were doing their video captures. And essentially, the way you got it is you got a presentation laptop, a VGA to S video converter, uh, a video selector switch. And you'd sit there, and they'd swap between the camera for the live person's presentation and the video feed from the laptop. And they'd capture it with, they, well, they were using a DVD uh, burner. But I'm going to use a laptop. By the way, I was messing around with capturing live with a laptop. I don't have the space on my hard drive to do raw compression. Or, sorry, no compression at all, just raw video. It gets, files get huge. I recommend using, if you really want pristine quality and you have the hard drive space, there's, um, I'm trying to make the exact name of the codec now. It's a lossless compression algorithm that's very fast. I think it's called Huffy. Is anybody familiar with it? It's decent, uh, but you still get huge video sizes. I tried compressing with Xvid on the fly, but even on my dual core pro system, it uh, was too slow. I ended up using Microsoft's MPEG-4 version 3 codec, and that seemed to be able to do a capture live at fast enough speeds to where I could do that. And I plan on the next time I give an a class for the ISSA setting up this video rig. So check back on my website later on, and it may actually, uh, <laughs> we'll see whether or not it works as well as I hope it's going to work. But now that I've got that up, I'm going to give a little uh, visual illustration of how this tool works. All right, on the left, you'll see video that I took with my uh, AppTech high def camera. And on the right is video I took using that rig I showed you in the previous PowerPoint slide. And I'm going to try to start both of these up at the same time so you can see. And I'll describe how everything is set up. OK, I want to demo how I plan on setting up the next video capture session whenever I do another presentation. I needed something that would give me small files but still keep a good screen quality for the PowerPoint presentation and the live sections Those where are I'm my showing people things on the computer. I've been using this camera right here which does 720p, unfortunately the files are huge. Here's the setup I have, and I'm kind of basing on the way that Skydog and crew do things at AutoZone and uh, Freaknik. Essentially, I have a video capture device here, and what it does is it takes an S-Video input, or a regular old RCA input, and converts it into something that Virtual Dub can capture. I have audio from this going straight in from the camera I have over there. The camera is hooked into the switch box, and so is this VGA to S Video Out adapter. This is about 50 bucks. I don't remember how much this one cost. This thing's only like 13, 15 bucks on a deal extreme. I got another switch box. Unfortunately, it's only an S Video pass through, and it doesn't actually convert the signal from the RCA jacks into S Video, so it's pretty much useless for me. But with all this set up, essentially what I can do is sit here with the switch box and hopefully switch back and forth. Now I'm doing my captures and compressing on the fly and the cat's messing around with my video capture equipment. Okay, kitty cat, go back. <laughs> I didn't uh, kick him. I'm doing my capture away. on the fly using Microsoft's MPEG because it was a little faster than XVID. Uh, the screen set at 800 by 600 and even though it has to resize down to 640 by 480, I think the quality is probably crisp enough for the purposes of the videos I want to make. Currently, I'm capturing on the same machine that I'm uh, 
doing this little presentation on in the actual sessions. What I plan on doing is having a second computer for doing the capture, of course. But I can just switch it back and forth, and that should take care of everything for me. And hopefully I can keep the file sizes down, yet still keep decent quality of the video. Well, hopefully. That's it. Uh, it's just a straight switch as far as I know. And the other method I'm coming up I may play with is this is a free tool. It's not open source, but it is freeware called Super Webcam, which allows you to overlay one uh, Windows uh, video device on top of another Windows video device, and you do a picture in a picture. And so I plan on trying to do the capture of the uh, presenter's laptop while I have a, a webcam on them to capture them in a, live in a corner. Someone once asked me, well, why don't you just capture the video on the presenter's laptop using, uh, uh, sorry, using Cam Studio or something like that, and then just add it in after the fact? Well, the problem with that is I'm recording some stuff at the Louisville InfoSec conference coming up later on, and most of the presenters aren't going to want me to take the laptop and install some EXEs on it to make it do this. But just jacking into the feed like that, that shouldn't be a big problem. So I'm probably going to use one of those two methods, and I'm going to be playing with those. I don't have a video showing this method, but I'm going to use one of those two methods for some of my future uh, live recordings. OK, then we're going to go and move on to uh, places you can host your videos. Now, I do, uh, I push about, what, 10 you know, gigabytes a day of uh, data, because I have most of my AVIs and uh, Flash videos hosted on my website itself, well, at least the Flash videos. But if you want to host stuff online, there's a few good places. Everybody knows about YouTube. And I think YouTube has gotten better as far as quality, because they were seeing all the competition that was coming out there that was allowing you to do high def videos. But I've had problems with the whole 10 minute limit, because some of the stuff I want to do is longer than 10 minutes. Someone said if you become a director, you don't have to maintain the 10 minutes. But I was looking around trying to figure out how to get that restriction removed, and I didn't see it. I also have used Vimeo in the past. Vimeo has very good video quality. If you I see some of John Strand's videos, he uses Vimeo pretty much exclusively, as far as I can tell. So I think he also cross post to YouTube sometimes. Vimeo, you can do that 720p uh, video there, and you can make some really good screen captures to look great. The problem with Vimeo is unless you have a pay account, they have all sorts of limits to how often you can upload a high def video, what size it can be, and so forth. There's also Google Video, which my understanding is going away, is it not? I haven't read up the news. What's that? Well, well, they bought YouTube, but they kept Google Video. But my understanding, the regular Google Video, which allowed longer, uh, longer videos, they're eventually going to go away and it's going to become an indexing service for other people's videos. But that was my understanding of it. I only like browsed the little news article. But Vimeo is good in that way as far as quality. Blip TV, though, has decent quality, maybe not as good as Vimeo. But the nice thing about Blip TV is they don't have as many restrictions. I can upload a one gig file of any kind of length, and I can upload it via FTP. So I was uh, uh, helping out with some of the Outer Zone videos. Uh, I'm trying to get Scott Moulton and his son and, uh, and uh, Skydog were doing most of the actual video setup, and I was sitting there ripping the, the discs as it was coming out as a DVD burner. And I hosted all those on Blip TV. The nice thing about Blip TV is since you can FTP the file up there, if you have like 10 gig of files in different files, you can just start the FTP process overnight and let it go, which is a lot nicer than using a web interface, which is prone to uh, faults. But even Blip TV, sometimes it will get on a video and just go, I can't convert this. But if you upload it a second time, it will convert it. All of them are a pain in the butt in some way or another, but so far Blip TV has been my favorite for hosting videos. Now, a few general tips when you uh, make a screencast for illustrating various computer topics. First of all, write notes before you begin. Know what you want to show people, and if you have the notes in front of you, you won't hopefully forget what you're going to say. Practice the series of steps you're going to go through before you actually do them. For instance, when I was doing various uh, cane tutorials, if you forget which tab it is you want to go into, you look kind of silly in the video going, OK, I think it's here. Uh, let me try this. Uh, so practice a couple times the series of steps you're going to go through before you actually record the video. And if push comes to shove, go in the virtual dub and add those bad parts out. If you actually watch some of my videos and watch the uh, 
clock in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you'll notice the time jumps. And sometimes a minute takes longer than it really does, or sometimes it takes less time than in uh, real life. That's because I've been cooking the video to make me look better. All right, consider if you want to record live or if you want to record the audio after the fact. I usually record my audio after the fact. Here's the problem. Uh, if you record live, you can do that. Cam Studio will record the, the, stream, the audio stream for you, but sometimes you'll flub a line or you'll be stu 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 stuttering, as I'm prone to do sometimes. Um, and you'll want to go back and edit it, and it's a pain to edit. The positive side of recording live is when you record stuff that's canned after the fact, uh, you sometimes run into an issue of you sounding sort of mechanical because you're saying the same thing over and over again and it doesn't come out organic. Or you might have patched together several different words when you had different levels of breath in your mouth and your voice comes out sounding really weird. So there's things to consider. I usually record after the fact just because I want to be able to say all the technical details that are going behind it. And that's going to go into my pet peeve here in a second. So I usually record after the fact and just make the video match up with the audio. But really, really concentrate on the audio. You can have some pretty crappy video and people get the idea, but if they can't understand what you're saying, those videos are really, really annoying to watch. So try to get good audio if you can. And avoid my pet peeves. And a large portion of the rest of this presentation is going to be on pet peeves. And I'm, I go to 12, right? Cool. Or a little bit before 12. All right, here's my pet peeves. One, it's a video. It's not an article. I see so many people who don't want to narrate the video. And I know the tool they're using for creating a video allows narration. But instead of narrating it, they'll do these little pop-ups that say, this is what I'm doing. And I have this long, spelled out description of what I'm doing. However, there's no way you can read this in the amount of time I leave this on the screen. Not to mention, if you're going to be writing a text article, write a text article. Don't make a video. If you're going to make a video, put audio in it and explain exactly what it is you're going to do. I've seen so many people, and it's usually they're making uh, how to crack wet videos, that do this. Um, all right, music in the background's okay, but still narrate it. But if I have to hear one more, as someone's doing a hacking video, no. And I have people who send me videos, hey, would you post my video? And they'll send it to me, and they'll have like commercial music in the background. And I'm like, dude, you know, I really don't want to do that. I mean, you know. That's problematic. And I tried to explain it to someone and said, oh, but it's good music. That's not what I care about. Also, try to, all right, how many people can read that from where you're at? You know what? That actually came out a lot better because when I was doing this presentation, 800 to 600, that's not so readable. Some people do the video captures at 1024 by 768 and throw them out there. And the problem with that is you have huge video file sizes and it's hard to read. And I like to embed things in my page. I usually resize down to 640 by 480, but do my captures at 800 by 600. And I think it comes out fairly readable. If you all don't think so, email me and I might change that around. Also, some people will capture it like 30 frames a second. And for doing screen captures, you really don't need that much. And uh, another pet peeve I have is sometimes people will say, here, here's this late hacking uh, technique. Do this. Click here, click here, click there, click there. But they don't explain the background of why it works or what the person's really trying to accomplish. So I really wish more people, instead of you know, trying to uh, just show how easy it is to break into a system, actually explain things behind the scenes. Because when someone gives you a tutorial that says, yeah, just do this, do this, do this, and it works, and something breaks, and you don't understand the background theory, then you don't know how to troubleshoot and fix it yourself. All right. That's most of the main presentation. I'm going to talk about a few events. Actually, I'm going to save that for just a bit, since I've got the time. And I'm going to show some of these tools that I use, just so people have an idea of how they work, more so than me just saying, hey, I use this tool. Now, this is Cam Studio. This is what I use for doing most of my uh, video captures. And let me see. Hopefully, none of my cron comes up. All right. Let's say I want to do a video capture. I can set it to do a, to produce either a shockwave flash file or an AVI. I usually record the AVI just so I can do some more editing later. Then I import it into a flash file. Uh, you can choose what region. You can choose 
just the region when you record, and it'll let you select the region to record. Or you can uh, choose full screen. Now I'm gonna break with my own rules because I'm not currently in 800 or 600, but I'll record it anyway. Also underneath uh, options, video options, you'll notice I have it set for, I believe, five frames a second and to compress using Cam Studio lossless codec, which for screen captures is just fine. All right, I have it set to full screen. I'm gonna do a little recording of the entire screen. You can also set this to automatically shrink down. And let's just ping irongeek.com. All right, I can stop the video, save it to my desktop, give it some name, and there you can see the video is there and ready to go. Now, that's a little bit huge, and it's not gonna be very playable on most people's systems. I have to make everything full screen to be able to uh, see the video, so I'll throw things into virtual dub, and I dig virtual dub a lot. Problem with a lot of video editors out there is, unless it has really pristine files you throw into it, they'll crash, and they won't tell you why they crash. They'll just borrow from the video stream. Virtual Dub is generally pretty good about that. If, you have, if it has a problem with your video file, it'll tell you pretty much from the start. You see that's full screen, that's way too big to deal with. Let me go into, uh, I can add in my audio file. Uh, I was mentioning uh, recording a separate WAV file. A nice thing about this is you can choose your source of audio and uh, it's a full processing, I think. Change it to an MP3 or whatever. You can do audio from a file, so you can say, here's the file I recorded in Audacity, throw this into the AVI. That's all really, nice features. Um, I'm gonna do some compression. I'm gonna choose C Cam Studio. I'm going to do video filters. And I was talking about resize filters before. In here someplace is the resize filter. What I generally do is shrink things down to 640 by 480. Oh, I'm in the wrong, sorry. 640, X480, and I usually throw it onto by cubic, 0 0.60. Uh, if anybody can tell me which actually is truly better, by cubic or uh, Lacozo for doing the resize, let me know. I've tried to compare them side by side. I can't tell the difference. I tried to Google search and people couldn't really tell me. So if anybody knows, email me or come up to me at the con and let me know. Okay, that sets up my resize filter. And normally you'd see a preview pane. I'm gonna turn off the input pane. And uh, I want to see just the output frame. But normally if I had a smaller video, over here on the right you might see both panes. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a file, save as AVI, and I'm gonna save out this ping, and I'm gonna ping, call it ping VGA. Save. And now let's go ahead and look at that video file. And right, Virtual Dub has some kind of weird bug using Cam Studio compressed video, so let me open that up with uh, Micro Sloths. And you can see, now if that would have been captured in 800 by 600, that would still be fairly readable, and the video file size was gonna be a lot, lot smaller. So that's one technique I do so I can get these things across without taking up a whole lot of bandwidth. Like I said, I'm already pushing 10 gigs a day. I don't really wanna go over that. Um, now, for Audacity, the nice thing about, oh, let me open up, uh, let me go back to Virtual Dub. Another thing I like to do in Virtual Dub to make everything balance out is to If I'm recording some audio, I'll sit down here, look at the time code down at the bottom, and I'll make sure however many seconds in I am, I'm in the same spot in the audio, and if I need a few more frames, I'll just sit there, select the frame, go five frames forward, because I captured it five frames a second, copy that with a little control C, then just paste it in a few times to make the video longer. 
and I can make it match up exactly. Or if I have a lot of dead space, because something took longer than I expected, I can cut the dead space out, which if I'm showing how to install an operating system for so, or, or something like that, or WebQuack, you pretty much have to cut out some stuff, because it's just boring watching lines cross the screen. Um, now, I've mentioned Audacity and a few things about it. I'm going to bring up Audacity real quick, and I'm going to see if I can find the microphone I set up. Now, I, several things I like Audacity for, it's just a super simple audio editor. I can say some stuff and uh, 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 screw it up. Where did I screw that up? Uh, 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 screw it up. Let me see if I screwed it up there. And, uh, 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 uh. and by the way, I'm not making fun of people that stutter because I stutter too from time to time. That's why I'm showing how to make videos in this particular way. Even if you have a funny sounding voice like I do, it's no excuse not for narrating your videos. All right, I cut out the part I didn't like. Now I'm going to start recording a new audio track. And um, yeah, wait a second. I forgot what I was going to say. I can delete that audio track. Let me. I can say. And wait a second, let me play that again from the beginning so I know what I was about to say. I can say some stuff and. Hopefully, not mess it up, but if I do, I can go back and correct it by editing the audio in Audacity. Then, what I would usually do, if I had it lined up the way I want, I can do all sorts of work with uh, clicking here, aligning it properly. I can then do a Control A to select all, and all that's in the menus also. Uh, do an edit and uh, do a this may be the exact same view version I'm using it at home. Quick mix on the project. Now it's all in one file. I got a little bit of extra dead space in there that I can just go in and highlight and delete it. I can say some stuff and hopefully not mess it up, but if I do, I can go back and correct it by editing the audio in Audacity. And that worked out pretty well, I think. Now I'm going to Sometimes you have dead spaces or you have a lot of noise in your file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak softer and I'm going to allow it to accumulate some noise in the background because the audio on this laptop is not as good as the audio on my desktop at home where I do most of my video recording. Let me stop that. And if we listen to this, it is the audio on my desktop at home where I do most of my video recording. And here's some pops and some noise and so forth. You can make that better by selecting a little bit of the noise where you're not speaking. Go to effects, noise removal, get no noise profile. And I think in the beta version it looks a little different, but the core technique is the same. Then select everything, effects, noise removal. I usually just use it on the default. You can take more noise or less noise away. You start getting this weird mechanical sound if you do too much noise removal. I'm just going to take the default. I could preview it. I can say some stuff and hopefully not. But I'm going to go ahead and just say remove noise and remove it from all of that. And as you can see in the waveform, it cleared up some of the jaggies. Now let's listen to some of that spot where I recorded noise. Allow it to accumulate some noise in the background because the audio on this laptop is not as good as the audio on my desktop at home where I do most of my video recording. And I got the squelch at the end, but I can always just go in and take those out. Then eventually I just save it out as either a wave or an MP3, depending on what the end goal is. And then I can import it into my video. And that's the core of using both uh, Audacity and Virtual Dub. Of course, there's a lot more to it, and also Cam Studio. There's a lot more to it, but that's the basics. All right, a few events I want to mention. Upcoming. Uh, down in Louisville, Kentucky, we have these free ISSA classes we're doing once every two months. If anybody happens to be in the Louisville area, check out my website or the Kentucky and ISSA website to uh, look into them. If anybody happens to live in the Louisville area, we have a conference coming up in October that you might want to check out. Also, some other good cons besides just not a con, check out Freaknik and Outer Zone. I'm going to be trying to make those regularly every year. Uh, thanks for the help from Venrev, Paul.com, and Informaticon Group for the production of this 
presentation. And are there any questions? Yes. Uh, actually, there's a filter, as I recall, I don't do it regularly, but there's a filter in virtual dub for rotating videos, I recall. I wish it had a picture in a picture filter, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they have one for rotating it, because I think I've done it before for some, some application. Any other questions? Uh, do you use any sort of a wave normalizer to kind of match the soft speaking points versus the high ones? I have. I haven't had good su success with it. Uh, Dave back there was telling me that the, uh, he might be a better person to ask about the question. He was telling me in the beta they have a slightly different type of normalizer. Uh, and there's a normalizer in Audacity, but I personally, when I've tried to use it in the past, I haven't had a whole lot of luck with it, because I've had that problem before. And generally what I do is I go back in and either accept it or just try to re-record the audio. But there is some kind of normalizing function. I just haven't personally had a whole lot of luck with it. Any other questions? Anybody, actually, yeah, anybody else can't answer the question for him? Okay. So, so you do it manually, but it's... It cool. I actually... It takes longer, but it comes out a little bit nicer. Yeah, I showed how to combine tracks, but you can also separate tracks and do that kind of work. She might find there's a lot more about audacity than I do, so I ask her. <laughs> I used, uh, it, next. Oh, I, I don't really have a question. It, it's more of, more of a comment. Uh, it, it's a lot easier to edit stuff if you make a mistake, if you just sit still for like three seconds. Like if you're, you know, oh, I went to say that, ah, just pause for three seconds. And so then, you can find where it's at. Well, not only that, but when you go back to edit it, if there's a gap, it's easy to spot your screw ups, but it's also, uh, if you've got that, that uh, uninteresting time, whether that's audio or, or video, it makes it easier to cut it back together. I film a lot of other people and record other people. We do uh, voiceovers for uh, surgeries of all things. And so I get people to talk over their uh, stuff on the scopes, like you know, stapling livers and, and exciting stuff like that. And um, that's the big thing is getting people to sit still after they've made a mistake. The psychology is always, let me jump right back in exactly where I was to try and cover it up. And you know we're gonna cut out all the bad stuff anyway. So if you make a mistake, just sit still for a second. And that makes it much easier to cut it back together. Also, don't jump out of your seat <laughs> when the video is over so that you can close your, like if you do transitions or, or cross fades or anything like that, you need, you need dead space where there's no content to add those things in. So uh, you can always cut out dead space. So uh, that, that was just my, my, cool. my tip was pause after you've made a mistake and it makes it much easier to cut it back together. Good tip, thank you. Anyone else? I, yeah, just pass the thing around because I, I can't actually see anybody with the lights on it. Hi. Hi, I have a question. Put some the microphone, go. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, just quickly. What type of microphone do you recommend? Sorry if you covered this in the first few minutes, because I, I, I hear people going on about really expensive microphones. Honestly, kind of I don't know, because I'm such a cheapskate. I just have like a little cheap old Walmart microphone. I have like a headset, that, so I have the microphone a constant distance from my mouth. That keeps me from like bumping it into my mouth and causing those little bump sounds. It also, uh, I can move it just out of the way so I'm not breathing on it. So I usually like to use a headset microphone. I just have that one here for demonstration purposes. But as far as really high quality microphones, I'm not sure what to tell you. I have a friend who has a, what's going on called a snowball microphone, which is like its own USB audio device, and it, was, it gave really good results. But I don't like to spend that much money on it. I just had pretty good luck with an El Cheapo uh, headset. Do you have any recommendations for like uh, capturing like a VHS to your computer? I would just use one of those video capture devices like I showed in that one video and uh, record it that way. And if, you, if you're going to do live compression on the, you know, as you go through, don't use XVID. <laughs> but if you have the hard drive space, what you do is you just go ahead and compress or not compress at all. Then after you have the entire thing captured, then use XVID to make it into a smaller file size. Anything else? Anyone else? Because I think I'm close to over time. So I'm just going to ahead and say one last thing. Anybody get a chance, if you're on the Nauticon Wi-Fi SID, go to crotch.iongeek.com. And if anybody's curious what my crotch is doing during the con, hopefully it'll be broadcast live to that website. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>